well. Greetings, friends. It's such a joy and a blessing to be with you today. Such a joy and blessing always to come and be with you in this um, ministry. I um, am challenged from month to month to dig and work on a message that will be fresh and real to me as well as to you. And so that's always a challenge to me, and it's always just a real joy and a delight to come and sit down at a mic and talk to you. I wish I could talk to you face to face. I wish I could just really uh, uh, tell you what's on my heart and and that I could look in your eyes and heart and see what's on your heart and we could have a, just a good time fellowshipping because you are a special group to me. You're a special group to me for several reasons. One reason is that you allow me the opportunity to share the gospel with you the new things that God is sharing with me, the burden that's on my heart at any given time, and and then you are special to me because uh, your support through what you pay for this tape really operates our entire office. Now, the Lord sends in special gifts that help us in a beautiful way, and we're grateful for that, but it's uh, your payment on these tapes that really keep the office operating and we're grateful because we're able to operate an efficient office that uh, uh, is uh, run without going into any kind of indebtedness and such like and so i am praise God for you. You're special people and then you stand as a group that will pray for me in special times, you know, for special reasons and for all of this I just really praise God and thank God. Now. There are several things that I'd like to share with you, and I think these are things that are worthy of your prayers, and I want you to write them down if you want to, or somehow get them in your heart so you'll be sure and not forget them because I want you to pray. And these will be things that uh, are coming up, and by the time you get this tape, they will be right on us. So do pray. I would, on some of these things involve people going places at certain times, and I, I hope that you will be aware of the time that the people will be gone So, on these trips. So you can especially pray for, instance, the first uh, request that I have for you is uh, concerning Marthy. She has been invited to go to uh, Brazil. And she and several other ladies are going to Brazil for a month. Now, they will be leaving the third week in October. The last two weeks in October, they'll be in Brazil, plus the first couple of weeks in November. Now, I wish you would just really pray. I, I am looking forward f to this trip for Marthy so much. Now, it's been a long, long time since we've been separated for a month, but... Uh, I think the Lord will give me grace, and I know Martha will be caught up in what she's doing, so ex and she will be so excited that she'll not even uh, miss me. Now, she might miss her grandson, but she'll not miss me. Uh, she has been invited to come down there and do some special meetings all over Brazil, so she's going to be traveling all over the country and speaking. And I think this will be a blessed event for her. And so you just pray for her that the Lord will just mightily, mightily use her. The Lord has raised up the money for her to go, and we're excited about that. And so you pray for her on this. Then um, another thing in relationship to the family uh, that I want you to pray for is our son Stephen Beasley. He has just finished his first revival as a preacher, and God did some things for him in it. I, I saw some real maturity in his life after uh, it was over, and so I'm excited about Stephen. He is our second son, our third child, and I just believe that God is going to mightily use him, and uh, God's going to bless him. Now, while we're on Stephen, uh, before I talk to you again, Stephen and his wife, Monica Gale, 
we'll have uh, our second grandchild. I almost said grandson. <laughs> that would be a little ridiculous without a word from the Lord. But uh, our second grandchild, I'll, I'll not say son because uh, we're expecting that second grandchild and we're hoping for just a child that is healthy and blessed of the Lord. And uh, so it wouldn't bother us now if it was a son, but I think if we had our brothers, we'd like a little um, daughter, granddaughter. But nevertheless, we'd be having that baby before I talk to you again. So you pray for us at that point. I think you'll have time to pray. And then um, I want you to pray for something that's going on across the country that's really beautiful here in the office and on the road I received messages from churches that are building buildings but they want to build them by faith now there's a real turn to this in our nation today people are wanting to trust God now this really excites me it really does because I, I feel that uh, the churches should not go deep into debt. I feel like they ought to be, ought to be solvent, and I, I feel that they need to have the opportunity of learning to trust God, and I, I believe they ought to have the blessing of, of seeing the glory of God move as a, an individual or a church would trust God. And I think that God wants this opportunity to work in a local church. And there are some churches across this country that are really uh, facing God with this issue of trusting Him. I wish you would pray, you know, that God would raise up the message they need for this occasion and that God will raise up the courage they need for this occasion. And... Uh, I believe you'll be blessed by just blessing and praying for these churches. I, I think of the church I just finished a revival in um, yesterday. And boy, that church is wanting to trust God for uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars and just really move on out, uh, you know, with the Lord and power and might and blessing. And so you, you pray that the Lord will uh, bless these churches. And then I want you to pray seriously and earnestly concerning the uh, nation during this election year. I have uh, many friends now that are getting deeply, deeply involved in politics as preachers. And a lot of people have a lot of different ideas about how deeply involved should preachers get in politics and of course I have chosen the route not to get involved in politics other than just praying for uh, you know the case and then personally coming to a conclusion as how I stand and I have not taken my stand as uh, to whom I will vote for in the pulpit now I have discussed it with individuals and I have contributed to other men that are involved in political activities. Now, that, uh, that sort of thing I have done. And so I'm, uh, I am uh, that deeply involved in politics. And I doubt seriously if I get any more involved than that. But uh, anyway, some of my friends are very deep to deeply involved in and so I'm keeping up with what's going on to some measure, and, and I'm deeply concerned. I'm deeply, deeply concerned. So pray this year that God's will might be done in light of all of the uh, satanic activity that's taking place in our nation because I tell you, this is a very, 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 very crucial, crucial, crucial year. And I know God will bless you if you will uh, seek his face. I, I know the Lord wants us to pray. 
And I realize that he may want you as a personal individual get deeply involved in this thing. Now, I know this, that a lot of the criticism is coming about and people saying preachers should not get involved in politics. Well, I'll tell you what, the heritage that you and I enjoy right now as God's people is a result of preachers getting involved in politics. If you'll read American history, and you know, I, you may not know or probably don't know that, I, of course, I love history, and American history is one of my favorite subjects, and, uh, and I've studied everything I can get my hands on in relationship to American history. And in the early days of America, preachers were very, very deeply, deeply, deeply involved in politics. And God used them to help shape the policies of this nation. So uh, that may be of some interest to you. But nevertheless, let's pray this year that God will have his mighty way, that the Lord will really have his way. I, what I find is that a lot of God's people are being deceived. They, they're being deceived, like uh, people saying, like this born-again concept, this born-again thing. People are just saying, well, this man says he's born again. I'm going to vote for him. Uh, we've got to learn to get beyond a word man's testimony as to whether we believe this or that about him. And we have got to learn how to discern the Spirit. And uh, this is a real test to us. I feel that God will never send revival on this nation until this Christian gets to the place that they can discern between the soul and the spirit. And um, and we're going, we're having some battles right now in the world uh, where we are being led astray to believe things that are not real when people are saying they're real. So we need to have a real discerning spirit in this election year and really move with God on, uh, on these matters of pres a president and so on according to the direction and leading of the spirit of the living God and not on the basis of what we hear in our minds and so on and so forth. Well, amen. I trust that you'll pray and trust that you'll seek the face of the Lord and really look on to him for what we do in our nation this, this year, this year. Well, this month, I have been working in the past month, I have been working on a uh, psalm, Psalms 126, Psalms 126. And I want us to discuss this psalm this month. I, lo I would have loved to have preached it and sent it to you. And I, I made uh, some efforts to do that, but it just never developed where I could preach it as a sermon from a pulpit and send it to you. It's much easier for me to stand in the pulpit and preach it to live people because it just preaches better when I preach it to live people than it does when I just preach it to you over this mic. But this psalm has always been one of my favorite psalms. Uh, it's been a psalm that uh, I have loved since I got saved by the grace of God. And since it's a psalm that has uh, so much to do with uh, soul winning, winning people to Jesus, I guess it's been a part of my life ever since uh, I got saved because I have always had a deep, deep desire to win people to Jesus. And this psalm definitely tells us about how to win people to Jesus. But I'm discovering that this psalm goes deeper than just a soul winning, uh, some soul winning instruction. I find that it goes to the depth of revival, and it has definite revival principles here. And we're going to discuss it in the light of revival. And when we talk about revival, we're talking about a person having drifted away from uh, the reality of God, the facets of reality, and uh, then being brought back to 
the reality of God and the many facets of the reality of God. So um, I want to read this psalm to you, and I want you to listen to it, and I believe that you will find uh, this psalm to be interesting to you. Uh, I want to read this psalm to you out of the King James translation, and then I want to read this psalm to you out of the New International Version of the Bible. So, just hold on as I get to 126. When the Lord turned again the captive of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us. Thou we are glad. Turn again our captive, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. A beautiful portion of Scripture. But now let me read it to you out of the New International Version of the Bible. When the Lord brought back the captive to Zion, we were like men who dream. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev, or the south. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seeds to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Now what a psalm. Beautifully put, isn't it? Well, what I want to do is just go through this psalm, just statement by statement almost, and uh, discuss it with you. For instance, when it says, When the Lord brought back the captive to Zion, we were like men who dream. When the Lord brought back the captive, well, what we are looking at here is a country, a nation, that had been taken captive. The children of God, the Israelites, had been taken captive by, by the Babylonians. And they'd been taken away. And they had spent time in captivity. They had spent time under bondage. And here all at once God delivers them from this bondage. And when they are delivered from this bondage, all at once <laughs> they are free. Now here is revival. Here is a picture of revival. Isn't that beautiful? All these people living under bondage. And all at once they are living in freedom. They have been set free. They have been under captivity, and now they are set free. That's revival. It's one of the greatest definitions of revival that I have ever seen. One of the greatest definitions of revival, I know. Revival is the captive being set free. The captive being set free. As I sit here and talk to you, did you know you are probably aware of areas of bondage in your own personal life and you are captive? It may be that it's uh, some habit that has you 
captivated. It may be that it's some weakness that's got you captivated. It may be that it's some sickness that has you under bondage. But you feel yourself under bondage. Beloved, revival is coming back to the Lord and being set free. Being set free. Now let's look and see what it means to be set free from captivity. To be set free in the Bible. The Bible teaches that a child of God can be delivered. Can be delivered from a number of things. It may be that you might even find yourself needing deliverance in these areas. The Bible teaches us that a child of God can be set free from sins. That's so interesting. Look at this. In Romans, the sixth chapter, the child of God can be set free from sins. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized unto Jesus Christ were baptized unto his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is free, dead is free from sin. Now, I, I believe that when we are liberated, delivered, we can be delivered from our sin. That doesn't mean that uh, we do not sin, but it does mean that we do not have to be a slave to sin. We do not have to be a slave to sin. Not only can we be, del be delivered from sin, but I believe that according to the Word of God, we can be set free from self. Look at Romans, the 8th chapter. It is something. The first verse. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. I believe if you read the rest of these verses, for instance, about the next three or four, carefully, you'll find that if you walk in the Spirit, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I'll tell you, if you're just sensitive to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will enable you to have freedom from self. Not only do we have freedom from sin, we are not a slave to sin. We have freedom from self, and we're not a slave to self. And I believe according to Galatians, the sixth chapter, the 14th verse, we have freedom from the world. The Bible says that we can be dead to the world, and the world is dead to us, for God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Now listen to this. And as many as walk according to the, this rule, peace be unto them, and mercy upon the Israel of God. I'm saying this to you. 
that when God restores us, delivers us, we have freedom from being enslaved by the power of sin. We have freedom from being enslaved by the power of self. We have freedom from being enslaved by the power of the world. Not only that, but according to the Word of God, we have freedom from being enslaved by the power of the law. Now you might say, well, what does that mean? Well, there is a law that works in our members according to Romans 7. And that law is constantly bringing us into conflict. Now, if that law was done away with, then, of course, there would be no conflict. But the law, not one jot or tittle, will ever be done away with. So we're going to always have this conflict within our person, feeling that uh, the good within me wants to do good, the bad within me wants to do bad. And we will never have any victory over this conflict until we have been liberated from law. And you say, well, how can you be liberated from law? Then law has to be done away with if you're going to be liberated with law. Oh, no. You do not see law ever done away with. You find that man is brought to the place where he cries out, according to the 24th verse of Romans 7, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I serve, myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So you see, the law is lived up to and fulfilled and completed and carried out and satisfied by a child of God being freed, delivered from the law, delivered from the law. So praise God. It's wonderful that uh, a person can be definitely set free. So what does it mean to be delivered? What does it mean to be delivered? What does it mean to be brought back from captivity? Well, it means that we have been set free, set free from sins, being enslaved by sin. We have been set free from being enslaved by self. It means that we have been set free from being enslaved by the world. It means that we have been set free from being enslaved by the law. And it means something else, that we have been in, set free from being enslaved by Satan. John, 1 John, 1 John 3, 8 says, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of of the devil. John, 1 John, 1 John 3, 8 says, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So when we are set free and delivered, beloved, the Lord works in our lives until where Satan's work is literally destroyed within our person. And it um, doesn't mean that we're set so free that Satan doesn't work, but it does mean that it, what he does work in our lives has to work for the eternal glory and purpose and benefit of the Lord. So what I'm saying to you is the person that has been liberated has been liberated uh, from sins that enslave us, self that control us, the world that dominates us, the law that brings us under condemnation, and Satan that would defeat us on every hand. Now, let's look back again at this psalm. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion. In other words, he set that bunch free. I wonder if you have ever been brought back to where you've been liberated. Well, that's where God wants you, and that's where God wants me. He wants us liberated people. He wants us free people. 
And that's what the Lord can do for us. Well, let's look on into this psalm and see a little more. We were like men who dream. I think here that we're beginning to get into the result of God setting a group of enslaved people free. I think we can see once they were set free, they had all of this freedom from sin. And they were able to see things just like God sees things. And when they come out of that prayer room, brother, they bring you out what God has to say about something rather than what man has to say about something. Brother, now that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. And I don't know that God could even allow us to all live in that kind of atmosphere all the time. But I think that uh, in every given situation in life, we ought to be able to see things ourselves like God sees things. I really do. And uh, I believe that uh, this is the will of God. So I, I believe that's, that's what we're seeing in this, this portion of Scripture. I believe we're seeing people so liberated by the Spirit of the living God, by the glory of the presence of God. They were them. They were as those that dream dreams. They lived in another world. They were caught up to the glory world. I think a good illustration of this uh, was on the mountain of transfiguration when the saints of God were gathered there with Jesus. They saw things as God saw things. Well, uh, that, that, this is it. So I, I, I believe uh, this is one of the first things that, that God will do for us when we have had revival, when we as captive are people that have been captured are brought back to liberty and freedom by our precious Lord Jesus Christ. And um, then it says, our mouths were filled with laughter. Boy, that is something. Filled with laughter. Well, when you see things like God sees things, then I got news for you, friend. You're going to you're going to change your way of acting. I remember back now a year and a half ago when the doctors told us that Martha had cancer. Well, I mean, friends, I was brought under bondage and I was captured by circumstances that was so devastating but I, I turned to the Lord and on Thursday night of that week the Lord uh, set me free liberated me and I saw things as God saw them you say what do you mean I saw this thing of Martha's problem just like God saw it as an opportunity for him to work glory and power reveal himself and let it, the world know that he wasn't only a God of the Bible, but he was a God that was living now and doing great things. And so, brother, I tell you, when I saw this, I was able to see things as God saw them. I, I was made happy. But that wasn't all. That was on Thursday night. And the next morning... Martha went back to the doctors and of course they began to find then that God had just touched her during the night and she'd been healed and uh, we didn't know this but that morning by myself in my hotel room I got to laughing and I was so embarrassed I said oh why can I laugh when everything is so bad and then I'd have flashbacks to how God saw this thing. And I'd get to laughing. And I laughed all morning. Well, I had some people to come in, so I quit laughing because I didn't want them to think I was a plain fool. And um, that afternoon, they went to get a car to drive me over to 
the hospital to see the doctors, and I got by myself and got to laughing again. But that laughter, that laughter was a result of seeing things like God saw them. And that seeing things like God saw them was the result of being brought out of bondage, out of captivity, and being set free, free. And you're set free. You say, well, it might just stop here. I, I may ought to just stop here and go further. The question just keeps coming up to me. Um, as I uh, discuss this with you, how in the world is a person set free? How in the world is a person set free? And I'm going to just put a parenthesis around this and insert this in this message. How in the world is a person set free? Because I may never get to the end of this message. How in the world is a person set free? Well, they are they're set free, first of all, by confessing their sins, having their sins confessed up to date. That's right. You say, well, what do you mean by that? I mean by conf asking God to show you the sins in your life that stands between you and God and your fellow man and getting all those sins right with God. Well, you say, well, what else? I believe then you're set free by coming to the end of yourself. End of yourself. Being brought to the end of your person. To where you are dead to everything except what God himself wants. And I believe that's it. I believe that's it. I know in my own case in this situation... I've already shared this, but I feel like I must share it in this illustration. I uh, had to be willing to let Marthy have cancer. And then I had to be willing to let her die. And that wasn't hard in comparison to what else I had to be willing to do. I had to be willing to let her suffer for months and years and die. But when I came to the end of myself, to the end of the rope and say whatever you want Lord then the glory came and I was set free and then I saw as he saw uh, we were like men who dream dreams <laughs> yes sir oh boy and then my mouth was filled with laughter yes sir you know that's revival folk our tongues were songs of joy Songs of joy. Can you see it? You say, what do you mean? There it was a spontaneous expression. A spontaneous expression. Not something worked up. Not something pumped up. Not something manipulated. Not something that man could take the credit for. Beloved, it was God. It was the glory of God just gushing out. Paul said, I labor and I strive, but it's according to his workings which worketh in me mightily. See, the Christian life is a spontaneous life. And songs of joy indicate a spontaneous life. And then, listen to this, I must go on. Then it was said, among the nations, the Lord hath done great things for them. Isn't that beautiful? Boy, there, amen. One, when, you're, when your life is spontaneous, the lost and dying world will say, look, look, Jesus has done great things for them. They will recognize Jesus in you. They will see, they will see. Rahab the heart had had it right when she said, listen, when we heard and when we saw the great things God did for you, our hearts melted and we wanted to get in on what was going on with you when we saw and heard what great things God did for you. What great things God did for you. Now, beloved, let me tell you something. I, what, what this whole world's looking for today is to see a manifestation of God in you and me. Now, I'm not saying you're not supposed to testify and let the world know that you know Jesus and all of that. But when they can see God in you, when they can see God in you, then they'll want to know the Lord you know. Boy, and that's what happened right here. That is exactly what happened right here. They, um, 
they recognize God in these people. The Lord has done great things for us. And you see, they, they literally turn to the Lord because God did great things for these people. I mean, they just said, well, praise God. Uh, you know, uh, since we see God in you and working for you, we want to get in on this. And I've already alluded to it, very have the heart of it. She's the great illustration of what I'm talking about. Boy, I mean, they just got right with God and got in on it. And the Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. And see, they then are filled with joy. So see, they got saved by the grace of God. This is what happens when we see ourselves brought back from captivity and set free. God does a great work in us, and then the people of the world see it, and they believe it, and they get in on the great work themselves. Well, then you hear the uh, psalmist turn to what I consider my recommendation for a saint. It says, Restore our fortunes, O Lord. You see, obviously these people had been stripped of everything. And they, they uh, said, Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev or in the south. I understand from my study about this psalm that he's talking about here that the streams in the south would have just trickling, little trickling, or just a little, just a little water trickling through. But every now and then there would come a flood and just these little streams would get out of banks and they'd just bless everybody with water. Now, I, I believe he's talking about that. Restore our fortunes like that. Amen. Restore our lives like those streams in the south. And then he says, Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying the seed, carrying the seed, now will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Let me tell you about an old man that will illustrate what I see here. I see here that the Word of God is teaching us that we as individuals should go out with the Word of God in our hands and tears in our eyes sowing the eternal seed of God. And if we do, we as individuals will come back with rejoicing, bringing our sheaves with us. Back some years ago, back some years ago, I was in a church in revival. And back in those days, I, I walked with Jesus as closely as I knew how. And I even, after all these years, I'm not ashamed of the way I walked with Jesus back then. I probably did not have to be so ignorant back then, but I, I was at least honest, sincere, dedicated, surrendered. I mean, I was committed. And uh, I saw God come in, one of, in the church I'm thinking about in great power. And God's people just begin to get right and the Lost people begin to get saved. And I said to myself, I said, Lord, my stars, but how did you get in this place like this? And the pastor took me visiting. And when I walked in this place, I, I met people that I knew had been in the revival meeting. But the pastor didn't seem to linger much in the living room when we walked in. He said, I have a special man I want you to meet. So we went on into another room, and there, seated in a chair, was a blind man. I never will forget it. I wasn't aware that he was blind. I'd reach my hand out to 
shake his and our hands missed. Then I took a second look and realized the man was blind. After I was introduced to this man, I was asked to take a seat and I noticed a strange object on the floor and it was a pillow with two holes in it. <laughs> that was strange and I really wondered about those two holes. Well, we left that place. We walked out through the front yard and the uh, pastor said, I want you to notice this front yard. There was a stake in the middle of the yard. And about 15 to 20 feet out from that stake, there was a path that went round and around that stake. He said, you see that path? You see that stake? You see that rope? I said, yeah, oh, yes, I do. He said, I want to tell you something about it. He said, I know you've been wondering how God has been getting into this church. He said, you know that old blind man? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, let me tell you something. He said, did you see that pillow in his room? I said, yes, sir. He said, that man kneels on that pillow daily to pray. And he said, did you see that path around that stake? I said, yes. He said, they bring that old man out and hook him to that rope and that stake so he can get his exercise and pray and says all he does is quote scripture and wear it walk and pray and brother I want you to know something I begin to see that he that soweth in tears shall reap in joy I went back to visit that old man and that old man was not surprised that God had blessed all over that country that week you know why because he'd been sowing in tears. He'd been sowing the word of God in tears. And they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Now I pray that you will take that instruction and let God speak to your heart and bless your heart. It's been a very sweet time for me to share this month with you. I just took this psalm out and I almost apologize for it except it has been a blessing to me. And I pray that it has been a blessing to you and will be. May God richly bless you and do pray for us and stand with us in those prayers and we'll appreciate it. May God richly bless you is our prayer.